I, 29-year-old female, am married to my husband of nearly five years, 30-year-old male, and we've been together for nine. Basically, I have been a part of my husband's family for a long time now. We have never had very serious issues, just minor things here and there, but I have always gotten along with them and vice versa and honestly considered them family until this past Christmas. Just for context, my husband is the middle child between his two brothers and is very much treated like so. In other words, he gets blamed for a lot of things, was always the problem child, etc. Despite him being an amazing partner, father, person in general who has accomplished a lot in his life, he literally deserves every bit of praise, but he gets shat on by his parents constantly. Before this incident, he and his parents and brothers were actually super close, talked on the phone nearly every day, saw our two boys all the time, etc. His older brother, 32-year-old male, is the peacemaker and stays neutral most of the time, and his younger brother, 22-year-old male, is the golden child who can do no wrong. And this is the brother I threatened to cut off. Now, fast forward to Christmas. We were celebrating with my husband's family on Christmas Eve, my husband, me, and our two boys, seven-year-old male and three-year-old male, his parents, and both his brothers and their partners. We were all drinking and having a good time, then decided to exchange gifts. My oldest son, we'll call him Ed, received a Nerf gun as a gift. I don't remember how it started, but I remember everyone taking turns shooting the gun. My husband, his brothers, his dad, etc. were all taking turns. My youngest brother-in-law, we'll call him Weenie, decides he's done playing and tells Ed to stop shooting the gun. I am standing right next to him when he says this. Before I could react or tell Ed to take a break, he shoots it again at him. Weenie decides to leap forward at Ed and chase him out of the kitchen, through the living room and into the backyard. Ed is actually laughing while running, so he thinks they're playing. Before I continue, I need to give more context about Weenie and Ed. Weenie has always played very rough with Ed, and Ed is a tough kid and can handle it most times. But there have been handfuls of times where Weenie is playing rough, wrestling, throwing a ball, etc., then decides to stop. Ed will sometimes keep going, so Weenie will take it upon himself to discipline him. In the past, he has spanked him, thrown things at him, and just takes the roughness too far in general. I have told my husband each time that it bothers me, and he needs to say something to Weenie. He does, and Weenie just brushes it off saying things like, so if I tell him to stop and he keeps going, that's okay? Or, if he did it to me first, that's okay, but me doing it back is not. I have always reluctantly kept my mouth shut toward Weenie about these instances out of respect to my husband, because he has made it clear that he wants to be the one to interject with Weenie. He is very hot-headed, mouthy, and doesn't tend to take the time to hear both sides of the story. Just very disrespectful, but again, baby of the family, golden child, blah, blah. Anyway, the last time he crossed the line was when he threw a dodgeball so hard at Ed's face. He was six at the time. It left a mark. I told my husband that him talking to him ain't working, and if something like this happens again, I will be saying something. The next time it happened was Christmas. So Weenie chases Ed into the backyard and finally catches him. I am watching through the window and I have a bad feeling. So I tell my husband to go talk to his brother about playing too rough before I say something that will spoil Christmas for everyone. He pokes his head out the door and tells Weenie to not be so rough with him. He's just playing. At this point, Weenie is just holding him in his arms. My husband turns to head back to the kitchen. He is cooking. And I watch as Weenie spins Ed around in his arms a couple of times and launches him into the yard, think like shot put form. At this point, my mother-in-law is running outside to intervene. I am watching in shock as she tries to separate Weenie from Ed. He overpowers her and goes to pull Ed's pants down and spanks him on his bare bottom. That was it for me. My mother-in-law finally pushed him away and he stormed back inside. When he came back in, I confronted him. I told him I don't like him putting his hands on Ed and I don't appreciate what he just did. I was calm way calmer than I should have been given the circumstances. He said, so if you ask him to stop shooting the gun in the house and he keeps shooting me, that's okay? I say, I didn't ask him to stop, you did, and that's not your kid. He says, so is this your house? I say, no, but it's my freaking kid. He reiterates, oh, so this isn't your house? 
I say no, but he's my child, Weenie, and I don't want your hands on him. At this point, everyone else at the table is quiet and not speaking up. My father-in-law is behind me scrambling, trying to defuse the situation, and he drops his wine glass and it shatters. After this commotion, my brother-in-law storms off so that convo ends. I go outside to my son to console him and talk with him. Ed was distraught, embarrassed, and didn't even want to come back inside. I apologize profusely and tell him what Uncle Weenie did was not right, and I was going to make sure that it didn't happen again. Ever. Weenie and his girlfriend left shortly after that, and so did we, so we didn't get to exchange words in person. I texted Weenie a long but respectful message, basically stating what he did was fricked up. And at the end, I wrote, I don't want to see your hands on either of my boys again unless it's a hug or a high five, or they won't be brought around you again, period. Thanks. His reply was outrageous. He doubled down about how I baby Ed and how he needs to be treated like that so he doesn't act stupid when we, his parents, aren't around, and how he basically doesn't respect me or my opinion because I'm not his brother. Any issues I had with him needed to go through his brother. Mind you, I have known this kid since he was 12. Initially, my husband was upset. He agreed with me and was really angry with his brother but thought Christmas Eve wasn't the best time to text him. I told my husband, if he didn't want me saying something to him on Christmas Eve, he shouldn't have done that to Ed on Christmas Eve. Well, now my husband is completely on my side after my in-laws have actually defended my brother-in-law for what he did to Ed. They have gaslit him to no end, saying it wasn't that bad and how he, my husband, needs to fix this whole mess. Weenie still has not apologized to Ed, my husband, or me, and has taken no accountability or responsibility for his part. And again, my in-laws are completely blinded by the golden child glow and can't understand what the big deal is. My husband is at the point of just cutting them off, or at least keeping them distanced for a while because of the way they have responded to the situation and condoning Weenie's actions. I have made my stance very clear. The boys have FaceTimed with the in-laws a couple of times since then, but have not and will not see them in person until they, Dick, apologize, take responsibility for being in the wrong, and accept the boundary I set with Weenie. I am being treated like the biggest jerk by my husband's family for this incident, and they are still waiting for my husband to fix things. So I, we, are genuinely curious. Am I the jerk here? Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment one. Honestly, the fact that he forcibly strips your son in front of everyone makes me feel like he is sexually assaulting your child, and the best his parents have done is have a firm conversation with the guy doing it. Have that jerk arrested so he learns to act right. Not the jerk for going no contact, but I think you are bad parents for continually allowing an adult man to beat your kid in order to keep the peace. Comment to not the jerk, stop with the threats. Stop with the follow through and don't go back. Your brother-in-law is hurtful and if I were you, I would have called the cops on him. I actually can't believe it has gotten so far. Put your hands on my kid or try to hurt them on purpose once, and you're out. Protect the kid at all costs. Forget everyone else who lets them be abused. Now, for the update, thanks for sticking around for this update. So, after that whole Christmas mess, things went from bad to worse. My husband, who's usually the one getting the blame, was now the one they expected to clean up the disaster. His parents kept calling, saying we were overreacting and that family should stick together no matter what. They even had the nerve to suggest that Ed needed to toughen up. Can you believe that? Then out of nowhere, my husband's older brother, the so-called problem solver, decided to step in. He called a family meeting without even asking us. And guess who was there? Weenie, acting like nothing happened. My husband and I were cornered into going because apparently we were the ones tearing the family apart. At the meeting, things got heated. Weenie was all smug, and his parents were backing him up, saying he was just disciplining Ed. My husband lost it. He stood up and told them all how messed up it was to defend Weenie after what he did. But then Weenie did something I never thought he would. He broke down, right there in front of everyone, crying about how he's always felt pressured to be perfect and that he didn't mean to hurt Ed. He said he was sorry, but it felt like a show to me. Everyone was eating it up, telling us we should forgive him. My husband looked at me, and I knew what he was thinking. We were being pushed into a corner. If we didn't accept the apology, we'd be the bad guys. So we did. We said we forgave him. 
but honestly, it felt like we were just doing it to keep the peace. Not because we actually wanted to. After that, things calmed down a bit. We started seeing the in-laws again, but it was awkward. Ed was wary around Weenie, and I don't blame him. I kept a close eye on them, making sure Weenie didn't get too close. But then, just when I thought we might be able to move past this, my husband's job threw us a curveball. He got an offer for a position across the country. It was a huge opportunity, one that could change our lives. But it also meant leaving all this drama behind, which, let's be honest, was a relief. We were torn. Taking the job meant uprooting the kids and leaving our support network. But it also meant a fresh start. My husband was excited about the job, but he was worried about leaving his family, even with all the nonsense they'd put us through. In the end, we decided to take the risk. We're moving. It's a chance for my husband to get the recognition he deserves and for us to get away from the toxic environment here. The in-laws were shocked. They couldn't believe we'd abandon the family like this. But honestly, after everything, it feels like the right move. So here we are packing up our lives, ready for a new chapter. It's scary and exciting, but I think it's what we need. And maybe, just maybe, it'll give everyone some perspective on what's really important. Thanks for reading. My daughter's college fund was on the line because of a storm. But when our insurance said no and family turned on us, I made sure they all paid for underestimating my resolve by taking them to court and watching them lose everything. A couple of weeks ago, we had a big storm and unfortunately a tree fell over, damaging our roof. One of the rooms, a couple of windows, and we have some water damage as well. The insurance refused to pay due to some nonsense stating that we didn't maintain our property and we should have trimmed the tree. The issue with that is the tree is on the border of our property and basically belongs to the city. I don't need legal advice or the steps to be taken, but our insurance is being pricks and refusing to pay for this reason. We will basically have to pay out of pocket to fix everything, but the legal matters will take a couple of months. I can't wait that long before fixing our house. What I need a judgment on, and one I don't believe that I'm in the wrong for, is wanting to use my daughter's college fund to fix the house before any more damage is caused due to rain. I don't want to take out a loan to fix the house. That is just another headache I don't want to deal with. My daughter's college fund is over $150,000, and is more than she will need for what she wants to study. We have promised her that she can have what is left for a down payment on a house or wedding. Basically, what is left of the money is hers to do with as she pleases, as long as she doesn't waste it. My wife and I sat her down and explained the situation to her and told her we want to use some of her college fund to fix the house, and every penny that will be spent will be paid back into the fund over the next two years. And if the insurance company is forced to pay, it will be paid back sooner. She doesn't need all the money at this moment and will still be able to go to college uninterrupted, as we will only be using just under $50,000 to fix everything. She wasn't happy with this and told us that she was under the impression that we will turn over the full amount to her when she goes off to college. I told her there is no way I will be turning over $150,000 to an 18-year-old and that her college expenses will be paid out of the fund and what is left will be given to her afterwards, not before. I don't know where she got this from as I have explained to her a couple of times how it will work and that we won't just be giving her the money. She then told us that what about her rent, food, and the other expenses? Again, I had to explain to her that we will cover those expenses, but she would have to get a part-time job for her fun money as we will give her an allowance but not cover everything. We had this talk a couple of times over the years of her getting a job and that we will cover most of everything, but not everything. Her fun money she will have to obtain on her own. The rest we will cover. This morning, I got a call from my parents berating me for wanting to use the money that was promised to my daughter. I explained the situation and again, the money will be paid back over the next two years, but they weren't having it, calling me a jerk for forcing my daughter to get a job. Somewhere she forgot all the talks we had with her the last couple of years and expected us to hand over $150,000, still pay for her rent, give her an allowance for food. Apparently, she wanted to split what is left of the $150,000 after college expenses and use those funds for everything, including travel, extra expenses, and other things because she didn't want to get a part-time job. 
That wasn't the arrangement we had with her or the numerous discussions with her. I don't know where she got this from as it is completely out of left field. Am I the idiot? Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, not the idiot. Your daughter expected you to give her $150,000 and pay for things like rent and food. Wow, talk about entitled. You should have just gone ahead and fixed the house without discussing it with her. You are paying her college by the semester, and by the time she needs it, the money will already be back in the account. She can get a job, comment two, absolutely not the idiot. Your daughter is entitled, you are not stealing everything from her, you are using a minor part to fix the same house where she lives too. You are already good parents because you saved a lot of money for her, even if it wasn't obligatory your duty. If she wants money for fun, she can find a job. You aren't an ATM. Now, for the update. Thanks for sticking around for this update. So after the whole mess with the insurance and the tree, things went from bad to worse. My wife's brother, who's always been the kind to stir up trouble, caught wind of our situation. He's got this idea that family should always help each other out no matter what. So he shows up at our door with a check for $50,000 saying it's a loan to fix the house. My wife was over the moon, but I saw the strings attached from a mile away. He's not the type to give something for nothing. Sure enough, a week later, he's calling in favors. He wants me to help him with his business, which is basically a sinking ship. I'm no expert, but even I can see it's a bad investment. My wife, though, she's feeling guilty about the money and thinks we owe him. So now I'm spending my weekends trying to bail water out of his metaphorical boat, and it's putting a strain on everything. Meanwhile, my daughter's still fuming about the college fund. She's been talking to her friends, and now they've got it in their heads to start some online fundraiser for her. They're painting me as this villain who's stealing her future. It's ridiculous. The fund was always meant for her education, not a free-for-all. But try telling that to a bunch of teenagers who think they know how the world works. Then, out of nowhere, my wife's brother's business takes a turn for the better. He lands some big contract, and suddenly he's Mr. Success. He comes over, all smiles, and says he doesn't need my help anymore. But the catch? He wants his $50,000 back immediately. My wife's in tears, thinking we're back to square one, but I've got a feeling he's not telling us the whole story. So I do a bit of digging and find out he's not just landed a big contract. He sold the business for a hefty sum. He didn't need the money back. He was just trying to squeeze us for what he could. I confront him and there's a huge blow up. Accusations flying, my wife's caught in the middle and it's a mess. But I stand my ground and he backs down, saying we can pay him back when we're able. Now, with that sorted, you'd think we could breathe easy, right? Wrong. The fundraiser my daughter's friends started, it's taken off, they've raised a couple of thousand dollars and she's feeling pretty smug about it. She's got this idea that she can fund her entire college experience through donations. I've tried explaining that it's not a reliable source of income, but she's not listening. And just when I thought we'd hit peak drama, my parents call. They've decided to step in and cover the repairs to the house, no strings attached. They say it's their way of helping out and they don't want us to touch the college fund. It's a generous offer, but it's got my pride in knots. I've always been the one to provide for my family, and now I'm taking handouts from my parents. So, here we are. The house is getting fixed, my daughter's college fund is untouched, and she's still convinced she can live off the kindness of strangers. My wife's brother is out of the picture for now, and my parents are the unexpected heroes of the day. But I can't shake the feeling that we're just one bad decision away from another disaster. Thanks for reading. My girlfriend lied about being at work and cheated. So I dumped her, but when she came crawling back pregnant, I played detective and uncovered the truth. So a bit of context. I, 24-year-old male, had been dating my now ex, 21-year-old female, who will be referred to as Kay for roughly 1.5 years up to this point a few days ago. Having dealt with getting cheated on in high school, I made it very clear to her that I tolerate no level of cheating and any such case would immediately end our relationship. She lives out of state from me, but not terribly far at only a 45 minutes drive between us. So we see each other every other week as we both work and I'm in college. She informed me a few weeks prior that she had a friend coming into town and that he wanted some Zaza, but they are in a medical-only state, and I'm in a recreational state. So in turn, 
I give her some pre-rolls to give to him once he gets into town. Now at this point, I have no sense of mistrust in Kay at all. She told me about how they were going to link up for a gym session and he'd grab the joints and that would be it. I haven't bothered to ask for his name, what he looks like, etc. All I knew was that they went to high school together. They hadn't seen each other in a couple of years and he was coming into town to visit family at an unspecified date. Now, let's get to what happened. A few days ago, I was getting plans ready for a date we had set up for the next day. Kay told me she had to work that day, so I was tasked with all the planning. I was texting Kay about it, trying to set up time frames of when she'd be here, where to eat, etc. This is when I noticed her Snapchat location was turned off. This is concerning because she's never had it off and we share each other's locations at all times. I asked her what the deal was and she says she turned it off for safety concerns since she didn't want everyone seeing it all the time anymore. This confused me since she can choose to just share it with me alone. I just pushed it aside as me being paranoid until she didn't respond back to my texts for two hours. Now, for most people, this wouldn't raise any concern as she's at work. She could be busy, etc. But she works at a small food spot and they have never been busy enough to the point where she doesn't respond for two hours. And she had always been telling me about how they don't have a lot of business. Fast forward another hour as I was leaving a workout session, I see that she still hadn't replied. I don't know how, but I get a sinking gut feeling that something's off. There are too many red flags to ignore, so I make a decision to take the 45 minute drive all the way to her job. When I get there, I don't see her car outside. I can't write it off yet as she's gotten sent home early before due to slow business, so I drive to her house. She's not there either. Now I'm alarmed. To be sure, I drive all the way back to her job and walk inside to ask one of the staff working up front if Kay had been into work today. They say no. At this point, I'm mad, and I let it get the best of me. Once I step outside, I immediately text her that I never want to see her face ever again and I drive home. In this hastiness, I forget that the same food spot has a second location and that she's sometimes been staffed there, but hasn't been recently, which is why it slipped my mind. I get home and I'm still pissed, but I realize I could have been wrong and acted out too soon. Until she finally responds to my texts, right at 10.07 p.m., that she just got off work. This added to my level of suspicion because the main location I visited that she works at closes at 10 p.m., but the second location closes at 9 p.m. She's asking what I meant by that last text and called me once, which I declined. At this point, I still needed to close all doors to be sure of myself, so I decided to call her back. I'm under the impression that she doesn't know I stopped by her job, so I keep it that way. I ask her why she has not been responding to me, and she gives a comical excuse about how her boss got pissed at her coworker for being on their phone, so he told them they couldn't use their phones on shift anymore. I knew this was a BS excuse, but I needed to catch her slip up. So I transition to a normal conversation about her day until she slips up and says that she'd only been working at the main store this whole pay period. And that sealed it. I caught her in the lie and finally decided to ask her the real questions, which went like this. Me, so Kay, where were you actually at all day today? Kay, what do you mean? I was at work all day? Me, I drove to your job and you weren't there. Again, where were you actually at? K. I, I was in the back kitchen with the cooks. Me. I asked your coworker and they said you didn't work today, so where were you actually at all day? K. Silence. And I hang up after about 10 seconds of silence. That was it. I had emotionally checked out at that point and was no longer interested in what she had to say. She tried to call me and texted me saying to let her explain, and she said that yes, she had been hanging out with her friend all day but nothing happened. She said that they had gone to the gym, gotten some lunch, and then decided to get a motel room to smoke some of the joints because his family didn't like him smoking Zaza, and they didn't want to smoke in their cars either. I didn't want to hear any of it. She had lied to me five times already, and I gave her every opportunity to tell me the truth, and she lied and expects me to believe anything else she has to say. Yeah, I'm good on that. Her friend even decided to text me, trying to explain it, and wanted to apologize about trying to do me like that. This just pisses me off even more like, oh, so you both knew and were trying to play me like a fool. 
He's trying to convince me about how much she cares about me, trying to have a man-to-man -man discussion. Meanwhile, Kay is trying to talk about how much she's afraid to lose me and shoot. I told Kay that I didn't want to hear any of it anymore, and that I want to just end it right there and now. I told her I wouldn't even badmouth her to our mutual friends or anything, but that I never wanted to see her again. And that's that, she hasn't tried to contact me any further since that night, and neither has her friend. She took down our couple's photos on all her social media, and so now I've had some of our mutuals come through trying to convince me to talk to her and work things out, but I've shot them all down. They keep saying that I don't know for certain if Kay and her friend actually did anything, which is true, but in my mind, lying to your significant other about being at work, to spend a day with someone they know next to nothing about is cheating. Am I the jerk for overreacting? Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, not the idiot. She clearly cheated, and I'm happy you stood your ground and broke up with her. You'll find someone better whom you can trust and who deserves you. Comment two, not the idiot, move on. She cheated, it's obvious, too many lies. If it wasn't so innocent, there wouldn't be a need for one lie. Now for the update. Thanks for the comments on my last post. Here's what went down next. So I thought I was done with Kay, but life had other plans. Two days after I cut her off, I got a call from her sister. She was crying, saying Kay had been in an accident. My heart sank. I didn't want anything to do with Kay, but I couldn't ignore this. Turns out Kay was fine, just a minor car crash. But her sister begged me to come see her, said Kay needed me. I didn't go. I was still too angry and I didn't want to be manipulated back into a relationship. The next day, I got a text from Kay's mom. She said Kay was asking for me, that she was sorry for everything and that she needed to explain in person. I was torn. Part of me still cared, but the other part was screaming, it's a trap. I decided to meet her, but I was going in with my guard up. We met at a park, neutral ground. Kay looked a mess, eyes red from crying, and she had this desperate look about her. She started apologizing, saying she knew she messed up, but she swore nothing happened with her friend. She said she lied because she knew I'd be mad about her hanging out with a guy alone. She was scared of losing me. I didn't buy it. I mean, why lie if nothing happened, right? Then she dropped a news. She was pregnant. My world stopped. She said it was mine, that she hadn't been with anyone else. I didn't know what to think. I was mad, confused, and a part of me wanted to believe her. But how could I trust anything she said? I told her I needed time to think, and that we'd talk about the pregnancy later. I walked away from her standing there, looking lost and alone. I felt like a jerk, but I also felt betrayed. The next day, I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. It was Kay's friend, the one she'd been with. He said he needed to talk to me, that it was important. I met him at a coffee shop, ready for another round of lies. He looked nervous, kept looking over his shoulder. He told me that Kay was telling the truth, that nothing happened between them. He said he felt guilty for causing trouble and that he had proof. He showed me texts from Kay, where she told him she loved me and that she couldn't do anything to hurt me. He said he was sorry, that he never meant to come between us. I didn't know what to think. It was like one of those TV dramas where everything gets flipped upside down. I left the coffee shop with my head spinning. Was Kay really telling the truth? Did I overreact? I spent the next day alone, trying to sort through everything. I thought about the pregnancy, about Kay, about what her friend said. I realized I still had feelings for her, but I was scared of getting hurt again. That night, Kay showed up at my door. She said she couldn't wait anymore that she needed to know where we stood. I looked at her, really looked at her, and I saw the girl I fell in love with. I let her in, and we talked for hours. She explained everything, how she panicked and lied because she was afraid of my reaction. She showed me her phone, all the messages, trying to prove her innocence. In the end, I believed her. I accepted the situation, the pregnancy, her explanation. I didn't realize it then, but I was accepting a terrible situation. I was taking her back without really resolving our issues, without addressing the trust that had been broken. I was setting myself up for more pain, but at that moment, all I could think about was not losing her. So, we're trying to work things out. 
It's not easy, and I still have my doubts, but I'm giving it a shot. I guess only time will tell if I made the right choice. Thanks for reading. If you liked this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.